Good morning. My name is Angela Wright. I serve as Chief Nursing Officer at Ascension Seton Williamson. I'm honored to welcome you today to what I know will be an informative discussion about Black maternal health and wellness. As a Black mother of four, this is a subject that is near and dear to me as I realize the increased level of risk each one of my children and I experience each pregnancy and delivery. With the birth of my third child, I experienced postpartum hemorrhaging two weeks after birth. This required admission to the hospital, multiple blood transfusions, and other procedures. Needless to say, this was an extremely scary experience for me and my family. I remember lying in the hospital alone with my newborn at home, wondering if I would be okay and survive. Maternal, maternal mortality is defined as a number of registered maternal deaths due to birth or pregnancy related complications per 100,000 live births. This includes deaths during pregnancy at birth and within 42 days of birth. Regardless of the income, education, or geographical location, we know Black women historically have the highest maternal mortality rate in the nation. I have witnessed this personally with the untimely death of a family friend in 2018 who was well-educated, successful project manager at a large oil company who passed at the age of 30, two weeks following the delivery of her first child. According to the CDC in 2018, Black women were reported as 243% more likely than white women to die from complications of pregnancy of childbirth. Not only are Black mothers dying at an alarming rate, Black infants are dying too. Today, we will hear about the key factors that put Black mothers and their infants at greater risk, such as institutional racism, sexism, inequities in healthcare systems, barriers in resources and lack of continued support after birth. More importantly, we will hear from Black mothers and those who support Black mothers on how we in Greater Austin can strategize to overcome these barriers. As a part of sustainable and system-wide commitment to listen, pray, learn, and act to help address racism and systemic injustice, I am so excited that Ascension has launched a new justice focus called Abide which is built upon the hallmarks of appreciation, belongingness, inclusivity, diversity, and equity. The hallmarks of Abide framework are demonstrations of Ascension's historic mission, values, and commitment to social justice, compassionate action, and advocacy for all, especially the most vulnerable. With this type of engagement, Ascension Seaton and Dell's Children's continue to work to close the gap in health disparities across Central Texas, especially in women's and child, children's health care. Our maternity programs, which include highly skilled obstetricians and nurses at locations across Central Texas, are committed to providing high quality personalized care that your family deserves. Ascension's maternal fetal medicine doctors are also OBGYN doctors and specialize in complications of pregnancy. We stand firm in this commitment and invite all individuals and communities to engage in the ongoing conversation to further this shared commitment. Thank you for your time and welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'm Courtney Bailey, and I'm the Director of Issues and Engagement at Leadership Austin. And I want to thank Angela Wright, um, Chief Nursing Officer at Ascension Seton, uh, for helping to frame today's conversation. And I also want to thank all of you for joining us today um, to discuss this important topic around Black maternal health in our region. Um, I'm, I'm co-hosting this panel with uh, Judy Maggio of Austin PBS. Judy also leads ATX Together, an Austin PBS program that brings diverse voices together to seek solutions on issues that matter to our community. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. We want you all to be part of this very important conversation today. So everyone watching on Facebook, if you'd like to ask a question of our great panel today. Please just type it into the comment section and Courtney and I will do our best to ask your question. Thank you, Judy. Um, so before we uh, introduce the panelists, I would like to define uh, a term um, and that is uh, birthing people. And what you'll hear Judy and I use this term throughout our conversation. And so birthing people is a term that is gender inclusive and recognizes that not all people uh, who become pregnant and give birth identify as a woman or a mother. And so now I'd like to introduce you to the amazing individuals who make up this panel. 
So first we have joining us um, Dr. Crystal uh, Barry Roberts. She is an uh, OBGYN uh, physician at Austin Regional, uh, Austin Regional Clinic. And I want to provide a disclaimer. Uh, Dr. Roberts is on a call. And so uh, she may need to step away for any emergencies. Um, and that will bring our panel down from four to three. Um, so just FYI, but thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, and we also have Rocky Lang. Rocky um, wears many hats, um, but in this conversation, Rocky will be representing Austin uh, Black Pride as an organizer and community uh, activist. Thank you, Rocky. And then we have um, Darlene Turner. Now, Darlene has been a doula for, for more than 25 years. Um, she's the owner and founder of Mamas on Bed Rest and Beyond. And then lastly, rounding out this conversation, we have Nakenya Wilson. Nakenya is the former director of Black Mamas ATX, and she was the first full-time executive director um, at Black Mamas ATX. Uh, currently, she serves as the vice president of institutional advancement at Houston Tillerson University. So welcome and thank all of you for uh, joining us in this important conversation. And so I thought to, to level set the conversation, it would be great to open uh, with a quote for our first question. And so I'm gonna read the quote and it's from the Combahee River Collective. And it goes, if black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all the systems, all systems of oppression. And again, this is by Combahee River Collective. And so my question for you all, as advocates for the reproductive health and rights of black women and birthing people, what does this quote mean to you? And I will start with um, Nikenia. Good morning, everyone. So for me, I think um, my mind goes in a, a million different directions, but I think for me, the thing that resonates the most um, and uh, I'll take it from a biblical foundation and that is when the least of those in society are taken care of, uh, taken care of, then all of us are, are taken care of. And we know specifically with black maternal mortality that the numbers are worse for black women than any other population. And so if we address those needs of those women, then it's a tide that rises all boats and nobody's left behind. Thank you, Nikenya. Um, Darlene? Nikenya, I had the exact same quote. That was the first thing that jumped into my mind, like, well, if you do these for the least of these. But when you think about it, if you have provisions for the least and that you make that your standard, then everyone is going to do better because as long as the least have everything they need, then everybody else is going to have what they need. Thank you, Darlene. Uh, Rocky. Yes, thank you. I, I echo those sentiments. Um, I, I personally believe that centering Black women in this work will lead us to the eventual success that we all keep speaking of. Um, and that's what this quote means to me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rocky. Uh, and Nakenya. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Roberts. <laughs> Um, so I um, don't want to re repeat uh, anything or much of anything that I've already uh, that has already been shared because I am in total agreement there. I think a another perspective to take it from is to merely have to ask the question. For me, when I hear it, it's a reminder that things are not equal. And if we are honest and, and true to ourselves and true to you know what this nation was founded upon, then we can come to the honest answer that inequality exists when black women who have been the backbone in this country nurturing their own children while nurturing other children while nurturing the black men who you know have been um, de you know masculinized in ways and separated from their families and multiple things that makes this a multifactorial question then we know that if we can uplift black women 
um, then we know that she, her arms and her heart spans far beyond her household in most cases, that there are other people outside of that home and outside of her family that she has impacted. And that's, that's what history has shown us. And so it's, it's a reminder that we have work to do. Indeed, we do have a lot of work to do. And, and Nikenia, you've been on the front lines of this work for a long time. And, and I want you to look at this though right now through your lens as a mother. I know you have three kids and ages two, four and 18. So you've uh, been up close and personal with this issue many times in many ways, but how have you been able to advocate for your needs in this system that has been so inconsistent, uh, so neglectful um, of the needs of black mothers and their babies? So um, as you mentioned, uh, having given birth three times um, and three pregnancies that were high risk, um, I, with each pregnancy, felt more empowered, more informed, and more capable of uh, advocating for myself. The first um, baby, I was 21, and I didn't really know if I was coming or going. The second baby, I was 35, and so the issues kind of were confounded because of age and other factors. And um, that was the pregnancy and the birth that was extremely traumatic for me and life-threatening for both myself and my, and my son who actually just turned five last week. Um, and I felt very helpless. I felt like what was happening was not okay, but I did not feel empowered uh, or confident to be able to speak up and neither did my spouse. And so the last pregnancy, and this is the juncture where I really started to get involved as an advocate for Black maternal health, um, I was able to have a doula. And I uh, selected my OB and I interviewed my OB to make sure that he had a firm understanding of my risk factors and that he was going to be for me and see me fully as a Black woman and everything that that encompassed and not just see me as a, a diagnosis or you know, a number or a chart, but that he knew the Kenya and he knew what I wanted for my birth and he was invested in making sure that I um, went through that pregnancy and that, that birth safely and that my baby made it her side safely. Thank you for that, Nikenya. Um, so my next question is for Rocky. So, while the disturbing maternal health outcomes faced by Black women are well documented, the experiences of uh, Black trans men and non-binary folks uh, who give birth are less visible. How can we bridge this disconnect and weave these conversations together to best advocate uh, for the health and prosperity of all Black women and birthing people? That is a extremely large question. And I thank you for asking it to me. And I also want to say thank you to my fellow pa panelists for allowing me this space to discuss this expansion that we talk about of talking about birthing people. Uh, what we know is right now with COVID-19 um, is that the disparity, the racial disparity does not stop at LGBTQ issues. It actually expands into it and we begin to see additional disparities um, added. And as someone who was recent, who was perceived as a black person who was able to give birth, a person who was able to utilize those organs, and then moved over into a community that is seeking um, similar care with um, an adaptation. I noticed that we have, um, we have a similar story that seems to keep coming up, neglect, um, that leads to fear that leads to not continuing your care, that leads to additional barriers. Um, and then once you are brave enough to get there, I think what we're also seeing is a pushback um, from communities all around um, that we are noticing is contributing to mental health uh, crisis, mostly along suicide, suicidal ideation. And I, I'm constantly being asked to kind of answer this specific question around how we 
give more visibility to that. And I think the most important thing that has to happen is that things like this have to happen. I have to be invited in to categorize, characterize the specific experience so that when this comes up again, it's not the first time our community is is hearing of it. In fact, I've noticed that masculine people seem to take up a lot of space in this and leave a lot of people that are actually um, affected by this behind in the conversation. So, um, you know, I think this is one of the first steps. Rocky, you did such a beautiful job framing some of the existing disparities. And, and we all know this pandemic has even magnified those healthcare disparities. Darlene, I want to turn to you now. There is this alarming rate that we want to educate people about, alarming rate of mortality among Black women and birthing people. Can you talk about some of the, the root causes of these unacceptable disparities and how you think the role of doulas and, and other community-based practitioners to support the birthing people and Black moms could help remedy some of these disparities? Well, I think First of all, the fact that we're admitting the disparities of this, because I still get people like, really? I had no idea. And I'm like, okay. But, you know, that is the first thing. And to understand that we still in this country have a little bit of issue with the humanity of people of color, Black people. We, we still grapple with that. Um, the notion that our traditions, our habits, our culture, the things that we hold near and dear may be a little bit different from mainstream white America, but that doesn't make it wrong. It's just different. And I often will say to people when they say, well, what do you mean? And you know, how come I proposed this to a patient and she didn't want it? I'll say to them, well, think about a Jewish family who has a baby boy and they're going to have that baby circumcised. They're gonna have that baby circumcised in a bris. There, you know, there is nothing wrong with pediatricians. There's nothing wrong with obese who do circumcisions. But for that family, they will have a moil and they will have a bris for that baby. The moil will perform the procedure. No one blinks about that. You know, no one. Th that is not questioned or anything. But when we say we have customs and traditions that we hold near and dear, and maybe we don't want one treatment versus another, then it's an issue understanding the humanity, the traditions and such of black people is important. And that, that comes, I can't separate that from who I am, a birthing mom or what have you. And we have to bring that in. And that is the role I think doulas play. We kind of make that bridge of here is a birthing mom, here is the healthcare system. These are the things we're trying to mesh together to give this mom the best possible experience. Thank you for that, Darlene. Um, so this next question is for Dr. Roberts. Um, so recent studies have shown that the mortality rates for black infants decline when they are under the care of black doctors, uh, yet black obstetric obstetricians and gynecologists are noticeably underrepresented uh, within the field. Um, so why is the pipeline for black OBGYN physicians uh, so limited and what measures must we take to dismantle these obstacles? Sure. And so uh, let's and add in there, you're, um, we are talking about obstetricians and gynecologists, but also pediatricians, because those are truly, you know, the, the caretakers for the infants in, themselves with this, this, the statistics, excuse me, do um, uh, translate into like we're talking about mat black maternal health. And so the team that's taking care of the mother, the children, oftentimes does not look like them. And um, that is uh, an unfortunate truth uh, in our country. And I, we think it's, it's rooted in education, access, mentorship. Those things are the underlying foundation to identifying young people who uh, can be inspired to want to do medicine um, and be supported and mentored through the steps that it takes to do it. And for, you know, speaking from personal experience, I had distant examples, no one up close and personal to take my hand and guide me through what would be necessary. And when things got really tough and really hard, you know, my family was there as best they could be, but um, the community, people, those of us who have done it, those of us that have access to other resources need to make that known. Um, uh, the Austin Black Physicians Association here, that's one of the commitments that we're making to try and increase the number of, of 
uh, physicians of color or, or students in medical school and how do we give them the support that they need. Everyone doesn't need a financial support. Someone, some do, some need support to prepare for the multiple tests that they'll need to take. But I think looking at how do we start at the community level, middle school, high school, by the time you get to college and thinking about medical school, there's so much that could and should be done prior to that time. So we've got to get into those schools early put people in front of students that look like them, that who have, who have successfully traversed the terrain and broaden that to include people who don't look like them, but who share in the cause of increasing the numbers across the board so that um, our representation can be better. You know, Dr. Barry, you talked about, uh, Dr. Barry Roberts, you talked a lot about the role of the pediatrician and, and the post-birth and how important that is. And I, I wanna expound on that a little bit. Um, are there adequate and accessible post-birth resources in our community? That's the first question. Second question, how can these healthcare professionals better support black mothers and birthing people with recovering and, and ongoing community needs? And I'm gonna open this up to anyone because um, I think this probably touches all of your areas of expertise, but Darlene, do you wanna give that one a go talking about the importance of post-birth help? Because I know that you do everything for moms after they've given birth uh, from helping with kids to washing dishes to just whatever they need. Well, I mean, that's, that's really the point. You know, I, we forget, and I always say this to moms, you're about to undergo a full triathlon, except you won't move anywhere. And they, they look at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, you're going to use like every muscle in your body to get this baby out. And after you're going to be really, really tired. And you know, they're so focused on, I want to have a natural birth. I don't have a C-section. And I'm like, but you're still going to work really, really hard. And then when the baby comes out, baby only sleeps every yeah, couple of hours and they're up, a couple of hours and they're up. And you're up with this baby trying to feed it and care for it. And, and I don't, I still have not found the right way to properly convey to moms how intense those first few weeks are. So as a doula, we just come in and we just try to be hands, hands on what needs to be done because mom needs to rest. Oftentimes she's not, mom needs to eat and she's not. Making sure that there are like very quick meals that she can have. I'll often go sometimes before, we'll have a little cooking party and I'm like, let's get some Tupperware, put it all in the Tupperware, put it in the freezer. And they think I'm crazy. I'm like, trust me, you'll thank me later. And later they're like, oh, that was so good that we, because you can't even think sometimes postpartum, you're just baby's crying and I'm tired. <laughs> and so to make that easy, I tell them, don't worry about the dishes, don't worry about the clothes, I'll come in, I'll get that done. It's been harder with COVID, but I still do some home visits because moms and the poor husbands and partners, they're trying and everybody's just deer in the headlights. It's like, calm down, you come in, extra set of hands and just whatever needs to be done, whether it's clean a bathroom, get the groceries, you know, put things away because mom needs to really just focus on her and the baby. And, and dad too, it, it's a very intense time. So taking all of that other stuff off their plate so that they can just, I tell them just lay in the bed, put on Netflix or whatever, and just lay there with your baby. And they think it's so like, should I be doing this? I'm like, yes, and we will take care of the rest of it. And that, and that's what we try and do. And I, Dr. Barry Roberts and I'm like, Dr. Crystal, you know, and I'm texting her or something because if I see something, I can say to her, you know, I'll say to the mom, is it okay? And yes, it's okay. And I can text her and say, hey, this is what's going on. But to help mom have that navigation where she can kind of rest and then we, the doulas, can come in and kind of pick up the other slack. It's really important to take that strain off of mom of thinking she has to take care of everything. Now, Kenya, I'm going to pose that question to you as well, because I know your work through Black Mamas ATX dealt with this directly. What are some ways the community can really advocate for and better support folks post-birth with what they really need? 
Absolutely. I think there's a lot of ways that people can come alongside of Black women. Um, I think one of them is really just gaining awareness and sharing it out and with your networks and your communities. And there are, are people who are in the healthcare industry, who are in higher education, who are in rooms that maybe Black women don't have access to that can put it at the forefront and make it a priority. Um, honestly, you know, there's programming and there's like one-to-one -one support for Black women, but we also need systems to change and to shift. And so we need people who have power and privilege and resources to decide that this is important and that it's not okay. You know, it's not okay for my wife or my, you know, my daughter or my sister to be safe and have a positive birth experience and my neighbor my church member, my colleague, and you know, my coworker does not. And so that may look like um, contributing financially to organizations who are on the ground doing the work. It may look like writing your legislator and letting them know that something needs to change and that we need better and more comprehensive maternal health care coverage and insurance. Thank you, um, Nikenia. Uh, before we go to the next question, um, Rock, is there anything you want to add in regards to uh, birthing people and resources? Yes, I do. Um, I think it's important um, that we ensure that we, when we're looking at this issue, that we talk about it, um, that all oppression is linked, and that we start to understand the ways in which policymakers pit groups against each other from within their own communities and how that is affecting specifically the black community, specifically in Austin. Um, and I also want to mention that uh, we've noticed that there is a, um, and when I say we, I mean the folks that are doing research in a separate existence. So a lot of people don't know, so I always come up with education as, as was pre previously mentioned. A lot of people don't know that in Austin, we have kind of this, this train of Black folks doing things, and then this train of LGBTQIA2 plus Black folks doing things. And bridging the gap between them I think will give us the enough power and policy um, and also enough power in talking about oppression um, without allowing us to be separated. Um, that will get us this, this um, addition that we need. Um, the way that I'm seeing this play out for our providers specifically is they're not getting training or offered training to support the families that they might need to expand into. Uh, and so they don't know the other half of resources. So making that a very clear point for people to be able to uh, route based on cultural competence. Thank you, Rocky, for that. And I appreciate that you mentioned uh power of oppression. Um, and, you know, I wanna, the next question is uh, drawing on like more historical context. And so we know that in our country, we have a long history of atrocities committed against black people uh, by the medical establishment um, from Dr. J. Marion Sims uh, with um, gynecologic experimentation on enslaved black women to the Tuskegee syphilis study, um, even Henrietta Lacks and um, more recently, the involuntary uh, sterilization of low-income Black women during the Mississippi um, appendic I can't say that word, appendectomies. <laughs> Darlene was trying to help me with that word. Um, and of course, you know, the list goes on, right? Um, so what are actionable steps that institutions must take to begin repairing this deeply rooted uh, medical mistrust and centering the voices of Black women and birthing people in solution-oriented conversations about maternal and reproductive health. Um, and I would like to kick it to uh, Dr. Roberts. Sure. Um, if, if I may, I will, I'll have to read it here. I, I didn't memorize this, but I want to read a quote to kind of segue into my response for you. And this quote is from the um, American College of, of Obstetrics and Gynecology, kind of the governing body uh, for which I try and adhere to with their practices. But on their website, there's a quote that uh, is, is posted there as their commitment. And of course, this has been posted uh, in the past year uh, with um, what we've been seeing on multi uh, levels in our society of um, 
of, of awareness. And so the, the, the statement says ACOG for short is committed to eliminating disparities in women's health and to confronting implicit and explicit bias and racism. This means recognizing and examining our own prejudice and bias and addressing the way in which healthcare systems perpetuate inequality. And I lead with that because when I read it, I thought they got it, it it's there. They, they hit it, they nailed it. There's an awareness and they're putting it into a statement, way to go ACOG, thank you very much. And then I took a step back and I said, you know, the words are on the screen, the words are on the page. And this isn't the only organization out there doing such. We, we've seen just a plethora of this you know, happening uh, definitely in 2020. And I, I take it a step further and I say, how can we move the needle? We have to move the needle by not being just about the words and just about the statements. And so when I see this, my org this organization go a step further and be involved in black women's summits um, and on the grounds for me, it's, you know, it's saying, I just because I'm black don't understand or at the, the pinnacle of understanding all the, the root causes of inequalities, I'm in a learning process, just like all of us on this panel, just like Rocky has reminded us. And I think it's time to take the words off the page, stop the rhetoric. We can put it down, we can talk about it all day long, but it has to then go a little bit deeper and move us to want to take action. And inaction, in as much as we know about death of black women, death of black babies, low birth weights, um, poor outcomes, postpartum depression going ignored, black women dying from postpartum hemorrhage in, 20, in 2020, 2021. We have to be about action and we don't need a group to get behind us. We may need that group to stimulate some fire under us, but we can do this one person at a time by talking about it, addressing it, and not just letting it be words on a page or on a screen. I wanted to chime in if I could. Please do. Uh, Dr. Barry Roberts got me fired up and ready to go. <laughs> but no, seriously, you know, when I'm thinking about all of the burden uh, and the harm that has been imposed on us, I think one of the things that I know needs to happen is that we need to stop, and Rocky said it in the beginning, and center the, the voices of Black women, Black birthing people, and Black families. A lot of times we have a whole bunch of experts telling us what's best for us, who are prescribing the directions that we should go and that are invalidating or minimizing our experiences. Healthcare institutions, providers need to make space for real conversations and feedback and dialogue and do, as Dr. Barry Roberts has already suggested, something about it. Um, I, you know, have worked with lots of hospital systems in this work in the last few years. And, you know, we have patient advocates and we have, you know, review boards, but how many times are the, those being affected at the table? as a part of those conversations and helping to create the solutions. We have to start there. Um, you know, ivory towers, we know, um, take a long time to get things moving, but you have people who are on the ground, who have lived experience, who have the solutions, but they need to be invited to the table. Thank Darlene, you. Rocky, would either of you like to weigh in on, on actionable steps that institutions can take? Go go right ahead. Darlene, you want to start and then we'll wrap up with Rocky on that one. Kenya and I, we, we kind of had along together and she's so right. We go to meetings and it's like everybody's talking around you, but not to you. I mean, I've sat there and I'm like, wait, wait. We have to have black women at the table because we're the ones affected. And what I've said time and time again, the solution to this problem is probably not even in the medical system. You have to ask black women, we have to look at, we have to think, rethink research. We have to rethink studies. We have to rethink how we're going to approach this and the classical education and everything is probably not what's going to be the solution. And if you ask Black women and Black families in the Black community, we, we may already have a plan and they're looking at, well, that's not evidence-based. 
well, no, it's our evidence. We have a whole lot of evidence for it. It's just not published in literature because we don't know how to publish it in the literature or we never thought to publish it in literature. It's common knowledge in the community. It's not common knowledge as in the, Kenya said in the ivory tower. So we have to somehow get not, we have to rethink knowledge. We have to rethink research. We have to rethink what is evidence based because it again comes back to whose evidence. Who are we talking to? Who are we talking about? Because I can go to you know a group of black folks and everybody there knows, so that's a hundred percent evidence, but it's not published, so then it's zero. And and you know that that that's just not it's just not going to work that way. So we have to mesh the two. And you know people are saying these randomized double blind trials, okay but we figured out it worked this way. And we can tell you it works this way because we've done it a lot this way. So how do we, we have to figure out how we're gonna bring the two together because funders only wanna fund the random double blind controlled studies, but we have it working over here, but we can't get funding. And so we have to bring the two together and there has to be some expansion when we're talking about research, expansion when we're talking about funding and expansion because the solutions are there, but we can't think about it in classical research terms. Rocky. Yeah, I think uh, main the piece if I'm understanding is what can what can organizations and people do to f affect these systems? Is that correct? Yes, mainly institutions, yeah. um, you know, the, the, the power structure, you know, what can happen within those walls to make things better? Yeah, so I think it's already been said, and I'm going to practice something that I think that this city and this country could practice, which is a masculine person shedding the heck up um, and listening to the people that already spoke. I don't need to reinvent the wheel every time I speak, re-educate in a masculine lens to make, effect, make effective change. I'm only talking to masculine people in my work. That is the truth. When I'm honest about that, um, I think we'll move forward. Well said. I wanna get in an audience question before Courtney asks the next one. Um, and this is from Linda Foss, interesting. Linda says, are there currently legislative efforts that you would like us to be aware of? Uh, also, Representative Donna Howard apparently has an effort in HB 320 relating to Women's Health, uh, Women's Health Advisory Committee. Um, anybody know of efforts going on legislatively in the new session that could address some of these issues? There are a whole bunch of bills, and I didn't think to pull it up. There, there's literally about 12 that are dealing with women's health and um, women's reproductive health here specifically in Texas. Then there's the black mom and momnibus, I can never say that word, Nick Kenya, you can correct me, which um, Lauren Underwood, representative from Illinois has brought up, which is national. There is a lot of work going on legislatively. Um, I don't know, Courtney, I can get it to you maybe after, but there's a long list of uh, legislative uh, bills in this session that are dealing with maternal health and just all the different things going on. And there literally are about 12 of them. And if we could get through and push those, and there's especially the ones that we're trying to push for expanding Medicaid, because Texas is one of the few states that did not expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, and it's killing us. I mean, it is just devastating to people, all people of Texas, but Black mothers in particular, and birthing people in particular, it is just, devastating. So I will get that to you, Courtney, as I'm looking at a lot of them we're trying to push. So, so I'll, I'll chime in. Yeah, I think the best way to make sure that you have a comprehensive list is to send it out afterwards. We'll be sending, Courtney will be sending that out. But to chime into what um, Darlene said, so during COVID, there was an expansion of Medicaid for women who had pregnancy Medicaid so that they were able to receive it past the 60 days. So in case you don't know, if a woman has pregnancy Medicaid and the income requirements and the qualifications are a lot broader for pregnancy Medicaid so that 
women and babies are taken care of during that um, pregnancy and postpartum period, but it ends at 60 days. And last legislative session, we got really close to tipping to the other side of expanding Medicaid, um, but we did not get there. So it's back on the table this session. We have evidence that with uh, COVID, when there were women who were able to have that additional um, coverage that it was beneficial. And so that's one of the efforts that I know that is being pushed um, fervently. Or the national, uh, Darlene talked about the uh, national, the Black Maternal Health Caucus and the Momnibus um, with uh, Representative Underwood. Uh, that's a series of nine bills that um, range from mental health to Black women or women who are veterans to funding organizations who are grassroots. Um, so I would encourage, we can send out some information, I think about that as well. But I wanna also highlight, because sometimes when we start talking about Medicaid, people are like, well, I thought you said that all black women are dying. And that is absolutely the truth. But if we go back to the very beginning of our conversation about the least of those, right? So um, not even just black folks, 40% of women who give birth in this country utilize Medicaid. So um, I wanted to throw that in there that um, if we are addressing Medicaid, we are addressing the least of those, but we still have even more work to do to make sure that private insurance also is reimbursing for doulas and paying them at a rate that's actually a livable wage, right? Even if, and, and midwives as well, midwives do work in for black communities, there's a, a heightened level of trust. If a woman chooses to use a midwife and a doula, they should not be penalized financially um, for doing so. Dr. Roberts or um, Rocky, would you like to add to that? No, I, um, I'll just a comment here and it's, it's understanding that if we really want the best outcomes for women and more specifically black women, we have to understand it's a team approach. If I get in my profession and I think that the, the buck stops with me, then I'm delusional. It does not. The visits a patient has with me on average 10 minutes of face-to-face -face time, maybe even five minutes, depending on how you know providers run their practice. And the care of that woman is way more day-to-day -day than what I get to see her for. And so I do, I think Darlene uh, referred to me earlier as Dr. Crystal. Yes, I will get a text from Darlene. Yes, I will get a call from her and other doulas in the community, other midwives in the community. There is and needs to continue to be a team approach, but that team cannot be brought together when the resources aren't there for families to be able to afford it. I just wanted to really quickly throw in something that people may not be aware of. It may be flying under the radar. It goes back to my original point of dueling oppressions, put pitting people against each other. Um, there is this move within uh, transaction where we are pushing back against this concept that we can define womanhood um, as uh, hormonal levels. And we are seeing that actually spread over into cisgender experience. We are seeing black women specifically um, being targeted as hyper-masculine and things like that and challenging uh, whether or not they can fit into a certain narrative of what is masculine or feminine. Um, this is extremely um, a, a dangerous rhetoric that we're seeing pop up in our legislature today, lately, all the time. And I want everyone to be aware that it affects all of us. And I hope that's helpful. Thank you so much for that, um, Rocky and all of you. And I actually have a follow-up question from our audience uh, from uh, Jai or Jay Fields. Apologies if I got your name incorrect. Yay. Um, Jay, thank you. <clears throat> so the question is, does ABP have resources to give to birthing people to find inclusive doula support and prenatal education? And does Black Mamas ATX also have the same, specifically gender inclusive? And so ABP, Austin Black Pride. And so either Rocky or um, Nikenya. I was, I was yielding. I was yielding to allow for, for Nikenya. Okay, Nikenya. Absolutely. So um, thank you, Jay, for asking that question. One of the, um, we hadn't had a chance to talk about it yet, but when COVID hit back in 2020, which seems like 10 years ago, um, we, uh, 
several organizations that support birthing people um, came together and created the Black Ma or the Maternal Health Equity Collaborative. And um, the core groups that are part of that collaborative are Black Mamas ATX, um, Mamas on Bed Rest with Darlene, Mama Sana Vibrant Woman, and um, Giving Austin Labor Support. And all four of those organizations are equipped and um, willing and ready to, ser to serve um, the communities that you're referring to. Um, specifically, I would say that Mama Sana Vibrant Woman um, has made it a cornerstone of the work that they do to be inclusive and to make sure that they are catering to the specific needs of those who um, identify differently than being a Black woman. And um, we also have some other organizations that work with us in collaboration, including Hand to Hold and PIP. Um, and all of our organizations um, are available to support um, all birthing people. Um, but I also want to yield back to Rocky if he has some additional suggestions. The only thing that we have noticed is that Austin Black Pride in conjunction with other LGBT run, especially Black LGBTQIA2 plus run organizations have seek, uh, have begun to educate people on what was just stated. So the only thing that we're noticing is we need to help bridge the gap. And we're also trying to uh, mount up some housing assistance and housing first level assistance across the board with all organizations, including BTLA Black Trans Leadership of Austin um, to help people People to offset some of those costs and they can start focus, prioritizing their own health. Um, so we are actively seeking others that want to provide similar services to bring them into this large work that we've seen and extremely grateful for the expansion of services that was just mentioned. Great. We do have a comment from an audience member and we appreciate you, all, you guys framing this so beautifully. This really is more of a comment, but I thought it might um, spark some, some additional comments from our panel. This is from Catalina Berry. She says the American Heart Association shared a great panel on this topic during their annual scientific sessions. There was a study of 1.8 million hospital births in Florida from 1992 to 2015 and when cared for white doctors, black babies are three times more likely to die than white newborns in these hospitals. These are some of the statistics that you all have been referencing. Disparities were cut in half when black babies are cared for by a black doctor. This, this really speaks to what uh, Dr. Barry Roberts has talked about already, but do, do you all want to talk about the, a little bit more about this lack of, of of people that of color who are taking care of the patients in the hospital and what a difference it makes. If I um, took a look at uh, a study put out by the NIH um, and I'm looking at my notes here, it was put out in December 2011. And that study termed a, a calculate, they basically created a calculator called social concordance. And it looked at race, gender, age, education of the physician and scored that physician according to the population served. And it mirrors exactly what you said, Judy, in that the stronger that concordance score was between the physician and the patient, the better the communication with office visits, the better the patient's perception of their healthcare quality. But what the study went on to show was it doesn't stop there, that there are, it goes beyond race, gender, age, education. And yes, in an ideal society, we would like to think from what you, you know, heard from uh, the, the, the comment there and what, what they saw in Florida, that yes, it those outcomes tend to be better when the provider looks like the patient because of some innate shared understandings or experiences. But I challenge us though, Yes, we need to get more people of color in the medical arena, whether they be physicians, physician extenders, doulas, midwives, absolutely. But more than that, it's not a pass for the, the, the non-people of color to think that I'm supposed to take all the patients that look like me. No, I challenge you to rise up to the next level in your understanding and ability to listen and ability to communicate so that those patients will feel more comfortable in your care and not 
walk in a room with your preconceived notions and I understand, I'm not saying this is everybody, but when you look at that study and you look at those numbers, that in itself is scary, unacceptable, and moreover reiterates why we're here having this conversation, because that should not be the case. I should not have to look at my doctor and question the quality of my care or whether I'm gonna die in your arms or my baby's gonna die because you maybe don't see the human in me. You maybe don't see the or hear my complaints like Serena Williams and you miss a diagnosis. You under treat me. So, you know, I, I, I put that out there. Yes, there can be some innate things that bring us to the table and bring us to conversation more easily or more quickly when we have shared identity with a patient. But we have to challenge those around us to move the needle so that we all are looking for the human in our patients and we bring the human in us to the table so that we all can start those conversations early and create those, those relationships of trust early. Um, Judy, I wanted to jump in because, um, you know, we're talking a lot of, you know, data and statistics and Dr. Barry Roberts was spot on, but I want to bring a personal lens back to it, if that's okay. Um, I have a girlfriend who just gave birth um, within the last couple of weeks, and she is, um, she was in Texas, but she got relocated to uh, Minnesota. Um, and if y'all don't know, there's not a lot of Black folks in Minnesota. Um, and um, she's 42, so advanced maternal age. She contracted COVID um, from her husband, who um, works for a large company up there, during her pregnancy. And she knows the work that I do. And so we have been communicating back and forth and she started to notice some things to happen. One being her blood pressure, another being headaches, another, so there, these things are mounting. And now mind you, they don't have very much information about how COVID affects people who are pregnant. So that's a whole nother layer. And then the baby was starting to measure small. And she kept asking questions based on our conversations about some additional procedures and tests that they should be running when she came in to visit. And they kept saying, oh, we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. And finally, she insisted. And they said, well, no, 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 we don't need to do that. Um, and she was thinking maybe she had preeclampsia. So she, um, because of her blood pressure, and they finally went ahead and checked her reflexes and she was hyperreflexing. And then it's okay, well, we'll go ahead and do, do a, um, a test to see, and she had protein in her urine. When the doctor came back into that room, she told my friend, great instincts, mama. Why does a black woman have to be an expert in her own health to protect herself from morbidity and mortality? It is unacceptable. Thank you for that, Nakinya. Um, Rocky or Darlene, would you like to add to this? I think uh, Darlene, maybe Rocky, for Rocky. Did you say something because I didn't want to cut you off. I'm just like irritated that she had to ask more than once. I mean that that you know, if I go to the doctor and I say, "Hey, I don't feel well. This this and this is happening." My expectation is and it should be that they're going to run whatever appropriate tests are to figure out why I'm not feeling well. This woman that Nikenia is talking about, first of all, she's 42. She, was she postpartum or was she still pregnant when she went in Nikenia? Well, regardless, there are things you do. You, you just do. And the fact that she kept saying, I don't feel well, I have this, I have that, that she basically almost had to diagnose herself. She's on the phone with Nikenia. This is what we're saying it's not you know I we're not physicians we're going to you because we need you and we need you to listen and that's that oh that just makes me so mad okay I was only going to add that I think that that we will find in time that this is actually just a, across life and not just an in infancy that we need to be seeing our same doctors mm -hmm. people that resemble our experience thank you for that I actually want to um read a comment from uh, Alyssa Renee. Uh, she said, thank you for telling the story. I'm the product of a Minnesota birth and my mom has still suffered 30 years later. So I appreciate you for bringing that to light. Um, so I would like to uh, leave time for our call to action. 
for those who are watching um, so they can know what they can do in their um, local, immediate, and personal spheres of influences. And so my question to each of you, what can everyday people do to advocate for the needs and rights of Black mothers and birthing people? Um, and I will go with uh, Rocky, if you'd like to start. I will just say that it was said earlier and deeply touched me to recognize the humanity in people. Um, how they show up to you is, is, um, is a very important thing to keep in mind. It takes a lot of courage, especially for people from my experience to enter care. Um, humanity above all else is so important in our next steps. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Rocky. Um, Darlene, would you like to share? And I'm gonna go out on a limb and direct this to people, non-people of color. Think about it. Would you want the care that we're talking about? And, and just really think about, you're saying, I don't know what I would say. Well, think about it. If you were going to the doctor and you were ill or not feeling well, would you want a physician to listen to you? And if you are hearing our stories and you are hearing the things we're talking about, take that to heart and, and challenge people and say, do you hear when a black woman tells you she's not feeling well, she has, you know, whatever ailment, or do you hear when she, you know, says, I had trouble getting here, I didn't have a ride, or what, you know, do you hear? And when you're advocating, when you're really thinking about it, think about what you need for your health, and then go out and advocate for that for somebody else, because if you think it's so much, oh, this is just horrible, or, or I would never put up with that, then why should anybody else? Think about it from, you know, would you want your mom, your sister, your cousin, would you want that for your baby? If you would not want that for your baby, then make sure it doesn't happen for anybody else's baby. Thank you, Darlene. Um, Dr. Uh, Roberts, and then we'll go to Nikina. Sure. Um, I would uh, challenge uh, and, and encourage those uh, that are listening to take a look at the list, I think that will be shared after the talk today and see if there's some organization, once you do a little bit more research that you will feel comfortable uh, getting involved with. A lot of the organizations uh, that uh, were brought up earlier have community small session, group sessions. COVID has definitely changed uh, the climate for that, but still a lot of Zoom meetings and just challenging yourself to listen more and, um, and, and be open to the conversation so that you can feel, um, I think, more solid in, in what we're trying to bring to the, to the forefront today. The other thing I would challenge people to do is look around you, that there is probably someone you work with or someone in your church that could use a word of encouragement when you know the truths about what we have shared. If you have someone in your office who is pregnant, who is thinking about becoming pregnant, ask her, you know, have you thought about meeting the doctor that you're gonna see before you choose them? There are choices in this. No one has to see me. You don't have to go to that particular clinic. And if you feel like you do, in most cases, there's not just one doctor there. There can be some searching out the good fit for you. And I would encourage family members, spouses, partners, support people, go to a visit with the patient, interact with that provider. Because the second set of ears in the room, oftentimes when I have that quiet dad who's never said anything, one day he feels a little bit more comfortable with me to ask a question. And we both look at him like, oh, wow, you, you, can, you can talk. If you get people in the room, they can be empowered to speak up and ask questions when you value or you communicate in a way that you value what they have to say and you appreciate them being there. So those are my thoughts in regards to that. Beautifully said. Uh, Nikenya? So um, along the same lines, uh, there are a lot of organizations who are doing this important work. And I, I wanna say this and hopefully it's um, taken in the spirit that it's given, but Black Lives Matter year round and every year. Um, there was a lot of attention focused on, on, on that in 2020, but in 2021, Black women and Black babies are still dying. And so when you look to where you put your time, your talent, and your treasure, make sure that those are aligned with making sure 
that all of us have the humanity that has already been referenced. Um, so if you are giving to you know organizations, check and, and see what their politics are you know, what they're supporting. Sometimes it's not even a matter, you could be giving to Mama Sana or Black Mamas ATX or Mamas on Bed Rest, but you could also be giving to organizations who are working against the progress that is needed to take care of Black people in this country. So um, what I think there's a term um, that uh, President Pierce Burnett uses, and that's uh, trust but verify. And, and be consistent and know that this is a long haul until we can get to a place where everyone is confident that they can give birth. My, my hope is that no woman has to face death in order to give life. And so until we get to that place, there's still work that needs to be done. Thank you so much for that, Nikenya. Um, so I wanna thank each and every one of you on the panel, uh, Dr. Roberts, uh, Rocky, Darlene, and Kenya, for uh, sharing your insight and your personal stories um, and for sharing the important work that you do every single day in our community. Um, and so as uh, mentioned, we will be sharing follow-up materials to those who registered for today's discussion. So if you would like to get resources from our guests, remember to register for the panels um, through Leadership Austin's website, uh, www.leadershipaustin.org. And Judy, is there anything you would like to share before we um, cut off? Sure, I always like to put in a plug for ATX together. This, this program today has brought together vital diverse voices to tackle a topic that everybody needs to know more about. And that's what we try to do on our program at Austin PBS ATX together. So I wanted everyone to know about our next one. It's coming up on Thursday. February 18th at 7.30 on Austin PBS. And what we're gonna be talking about is the future of I-35 mm -hmm. and how rebuilding and reimagining that highway that's happening right now can actually possibly right some of the racist wrongs of Austin's past. So it's gonna be a great topic and I hope everybody will tune in for that. And, and thank you all again for shedding light on this vital topic for our community. And thank you again, Judy. And so I'm going to close with a comment from uh, Rona Walton. She said, love your neighbors as you love yourself. So with that being said, I hope to see you next month um, for our next engaged topic on uh, the economic impact of COVID-19 a year later. Um, and thank you and have a good morning.